what we have. We have a, a given matrix for an ensemble of matrices. In this case, would be n times n symmetric real matrices. Suppose that we do not like lambda vector A, the spectrum of A. And what we did it was to define the empirical spectral density given a matrix A, like rho sub A of lambda is equal 1 over n, the sum i from 1 to n of the direct delta of lambda, lambda i. And the exercise was to write, try to express this thing as a, something related to a problem in a, in a stack mech, right? Did you manage to do this? More or less? You don't know how to treat what? Uh, yeah, yeah, very good. So shall we do it together? So the idea is the following. So first, let me. The goal here, the, the tricks I'm going to use. The first one is that one minus okay, the limit for eta going to zero plus of one divided by x minus i eta is equal to the principal Cauchy of one divided by x plus i pi delta, direct delta of x. Yeah? Let me, to simplify the notation a bit and not to write too much, for the time being, I'm going to assume that every time there is an, an eta, the limit of eta going to zero plus is implicit. Okay? So, what I, what, uh, what I notice is that the, uh, the imaginary part of this is equal to pi Dirac delta, therefore, Dirac delta is equal to 1 over pi, the imaginary part of 1 divided by x minus i eta, right? Now let us focus on this part here, okay? I have in the sum Dirac delta of lambda minus lambda ai, so using this, I can write this thing as 1 divided by pi, the imaginary part of 1 divided by lambda minus lambda i a minus i eta, right? And then I put, you see, I do, I do the derivation from the definition step by step now to the sum. So then I'll have that rho sub a of lambda is equal to 1 divided by pi n of the imaginary part the sum of i from 1 to n of 1 divided by lambda minus lambda ai minus i eta. Right? That's why I get rid of the <laughs> annoying principal Cauchy part, taking the, the imaginary part. And now what can I do? I can do the following. I can write this thing as 1 divided by pi n, the imaginary part, of the derivative with respect to set of the sum i from 1 to n of the logarithm of set minus lambda i a when set is equal to lambda minus i eta. Right? But this is equal to 1 divided by pi n, the imaginary part of the derivative with respect to zeta of the logarithm of the product of phi from 1 to n of z minus lambda i a for z equal to lambda minus i eta, right? Are you with me? But the logarithm this part here, the logarithm of the product for i from 1 to n of zeta minus lambda a i 
is equal to the logarithm of the determinant of zeta, of zeta times the identity matrix n times n minus a. Yeah? Because if I do analyze this, this is a symmetric matrix, can be diagonalized by orthogonal transformation. The logarithm of the determinant of this is equal to this. Good. And this, I can write the task now. Uh, as follows, no? Um, wait a second. I can do minus two, the logarithm of one over the square root of the determinant of set. This part, uh, by the way, this map, you can do it in different ways, okay? To get to the final result. But th this is just one of the three or four ways to, to get there. So what I have achieved, I have achieved to write, to express this in terms of the logarithm of a determinant. The determinant has a Gaussian expression, and that Gaussian integral expression is going to be our partition function. All right, so let me put all the pieces together. So we end up having the following, no? that rho sub a of lambda is equal to 1 divided by pi n, the imaginary part of the derivative with respect to z. I have here a minus 2 of the logarithm, oh, sorry, of 1 over, sorry, no, the, so one second, the logarithm of 1 over the square root of the determinant of a set times the identity matrix minus a. That is equal to lambda minus i eta. Right. So far, so good. I, ha I have not done anything fancy at all. Okay. Now remember that now I can write one over the square root of the determinant of what is a symmetric matrix as follows. I can write this thing as an integral for the product of i. From 1 to n, dxi divided by 2 pi of the exponential of minus 1 half the sum for i and j from 1 to n of xi set identity matrix A entries ij, xj. Call this object my partition function, although it's not really a partition function because Set is complex, right? But morally speaking, it looks like a partition function. Let's call this thing set of set. So what we find is that the rho sub a of lambda, and I guess this depends on a, is equal to minus 2 divided by pi n, the imaginary part of the reality with respect to set of the logarithm of set Questions? But it's symmetric. It's, no, it's, it's symmetric. It has a small imaginary part. It's not an issue. If you think it is an issue, what you can do is to use what is called a bosonic representation for the determinant. So what would you would do instead of using this trick, you will do this. Uh, 
logarithm of 1 divided by the determinant. And then you can use the other formula we discussed, the one for a general complex matrix. Yeah? But you can use this one. So you see a problem or an object related to a, a problem in random matrices, or in, for a matrix, still this matrix is a given matrix, can be related to, you know, an observable related, related to some, some sort of a, a spin glass problem, right? Where in this case the dynamical variables are continuous spins, yeah? and the interactions between these variables are given by the matrix entries of the matrix you are interested in calculating the empirical spectral density. So for somebody that was asking yesterday, well, but if I know the eigenvalues, why well, I should worry about this. So the question, if you see what happens here is that I express the, the, the spectral density directly in terms of the matrix entries. If for some reason, I'm interested in calculating the expectation of, of this object with respect to an ensemble of random matrices, I don't need to dia diagonalize to calculate this object. The only thing I need to worry about is to do the expectation value with respect to the matrix entries. So I overcome the problem of diagonalizing matrices. All right. Is there a minus three in the first There is a minus here, yes. Now, if you go back, well, if you go back, no. Now in the context of this, stack make problem, yeah? the logarithm of a partition function is normally, and if when the logarithm of a partition function is a free energy. And the derivatives with respect to the logarithm of the partition function generates observables of interest. So here you see, if I were to do, here I have to put one set is equal to lambda minus eta. So if I were to do the, the derivative with respect to set, of this expression, what I obtain is the following. So I obtain the expectation value of something. So I can relate directly the spectral density to the expectation, the thermal expectation value of a local quantity. So the derivative with the minus two, as, let's do it like this, the derivative minus two, the partial derivative of the logarithm of this object is going to be what? It's going to be a one over set A. And then I'll have a, the integral. Let's put this integral in this way, dnx. And then I'll have, let us call this thing exponential of minus I don't know, a Hamiltonian with uh, the sum, when I do the, the, the derivative with respect to a, a set, I have the sum i from 1 to n of x i squared. Yeah? So let me introduce the equivalent of what would be the Gibbs measure, p of x, is equal to 1 over set a set of the exponential of this minus h of x, where h of x is equal to one half of the sum for i and j from one to n of x i, uh, set one minus a i j x j. Yeah. And just using the vocabulary of stack maker, huh? So then this means that this guy here, minus two times the partial derivative with respect to set of the logarithm of the partition function, yeah, this is equal to the expectation value, sorry, the sum for i from one to n of the expectation value of x i squared. So therefore, in this mapping, the spectral, the empirical spectral density associated to a matrix A 
is equal to 1 divided by pi n, the imaginary part of the sum of pi from 1 to n of the expectation value of x i squared. Okay, when z is equal to lambda minus i eta. So you see, again, I'm relating the spectral density of a matrix to the expectation value of a local observable related to a Hamiltonian. Can you speak up? Sorry? You didn't get this part. The only thing I'm, I'm, I'm doing is using the analogy with the statistical mechanics. So I define a Hamiltonian, which is the, what is inside the argument of the exponential, right? And since this is the partition function, the exponential of the Hamiltonian divided by the partition function is equivalent to the Gibbs measure that appears in StackMec, right? Now I notice that if I do the derivative of the logarithm of the partition function with respect to Z, in this vocabulary, this is equivalent of calculating the expectation value of these variables that appear in the Hamiltonian. Good? Ah, because the... Sorry, sorry. Yeah, because, sorry, this is the identity matrix. Am I taking the elements I and J? Yeah. So, so what this thing means? Yeah. Sorry, maybe maybe I didn't explain this this part. So this is the set times the identity matrix minus the matrix A. So the entry I J is set Kronecker delta I J minus A I J. So in this sum, the first sum only the, the the diagonal term remains. That's why you have here X I square. Thanks. The Gaussian. Which Gaussian? There are several Gaussians here. Yeah, I mean the x i over square root of outside. A square root of, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, a square root. Yeah. Thank you very much. Actually, it doesn't matter <laughs> in the end, because since, since you have the logarithm, and this is with respect to, a, to an expectation value, this factor, will, it will cancel, right? But it's important to... Uh, to be precise, thank you. More questions? Um, yeah, how do you handle the logarithm of the integral? Here? So I have to do the derivative of the logarithm of the partition function. This would be one over the partition function, the derivative of the integral, right? The set is in the integral. You apply what is called that the derivative of an integral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Sorry. What a second. Uh, sorry, I don't. I didn't get why you need to specify the set is equal to lambda minus i eta if z does not appear in such expression as n. You don't get that. Sorry, what? I mean, uh, the set is equal to lambda minus i eta. Yeah. No. It's it's to just be a bit more. Uh, Picky with, uh, with the notation is to remind that this set is, is lambda minus uh, i eta. It's just that. Okay? So this expectation value depends on the Gibbs of Boltzmann measure. That depends on the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian depends on this set. This set must be lambda minus i epsilon. It's not for any set. It's, it's just that. I was trying to be a bit more explicit. Okay? And remember that also eta has to be taken in the limit when eta goes to zero plus. Yeah. More questions? Uh, why did we relate the local observable with the last uh, expression? How, sorry, what? Why did we relate the local observable in the last uh, expression with the... Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand the question. So it's what I said, that, uh, that this spectral density is related to the expectation values of local observables. Well, because this, this observable, right, it depends on a given node, right? It depends locally of something on the graph or something in the, in the matrix, which is just, is just node. So 
So it's a local quantity. So you don't have, for instance, a, a function that depends on a collection of, of variables that takes into account, for instance, an extensive part of the matrix. That's why it's, I say it's a local observable. No, sorry, can you speak up? I don't. Why can I, do I not keep the Diagonal terms? Why I don't, I mean, yeah, I, I do keep them. I'm going to use them. Yeah, yeah, the, the only thing I was saying here is like this notation means for i and j, yeah, that this is equal to set the chronicle delta i, 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 j and a i j, right? So here is for all i and j. And of course, here you'll have a diagonal part. The only thing I put this thing here is to emphasize that when I do the derivative with respect set, you know, set is coupled to the chronicle delta, and therefore only the diagonal part of this sum for this term is what appears here. So that's why you have an xi square. Yeah, but there is, so you see this mapping is exact. There is nothing I put, no assumption for A. So A can be whatever. Well, a symmetric matrix, okay? So the, the, the spectrum has to be, has to be real. Yeah? More questions? Okay. Now, so forget about now the rest of the universe. That means, let's forget our, a, a second about this problem. Or this mapping. And realize the following. That, so I have here, uh, the spectral density depends on the expectation values of this sort, yeah? So you remember when we discussed cavity method, the way I introduced it, and a simple way to, to get the expression for the magnetization, right? So here, in principle, well, for definition, the expectation value would be equal to, to what? Would be equal to the integral over all values of x, a joint probability distribution for the x's, and then xi squared. So since I only know the expectation value for one of the entries, local observable, this means that this is equal to the integral with respect to xi, pi xi, I square. Yeah? Good. So if I'm only interested in this expectation value, the trick is to find a way to see whether I can write close equations for pi xi, right? So can I, or can we, uh, write down Simple close equations for pi xi. Right. Well, let's think about the cavity method, the way we introduce it. Uh, so the cavity method, we introduce it for uh, the Hamiltonian of an uh, easy model with pairwise interactions. And in this case, we have a Hamiltonian h of x, which is um, the sum of i and j. I think there is one half, which I miss. No. Sum over i and j, x i, z, right? i, j, x, j. So this is also pairwise, yeah? The only difference between this, this Hamiltonian and this Hamiltonian of the EC model is that these are real variables. The one in the IC model, they are is in variables, they take uh, min, uh, values plus minus ones. But if you, think, uh, if you think about the cavity method, the steps you do have nothing to do with the character, okay, the type of random variable you have, dynamical variable, has more to do with the factorization we discuss. Okay? The fact that this Hamiltonian can be written for a given node as something happening to that node the interaction of that node with the rest of the universe and what happens with the rest of the universe, the, the rest of the, of the graph. Yeah? So now we are going to do an exercise. I'm going to delete this. 
where we are going to derive the equivalent of the cavity equations for this Hamiltonian. And the idea is to show, I'm going to give you the final formula if I can, is to show that the single side marginal pi xi can be written as follows. Can be written as 1 over set i exponential of uh, minus set xi squared divided by 2 and then times an integral that takes into account, give me a second, <coughs> takes into account um, the neighbors of i of the distribution when i has been removed of the neighbors of i and then the following, no? Um, the sum for the neighbors of, of i of x i a i a i l x l. Okay? Or something like this. So this derivation of so this relationship is exact. When you derive this relationship, you can apply the, you can assume that uh, maybe you are in a random graph, or you can assume uh, uh, the beta, beta bias approximation for this joint probability, no? Assuming beta bias approximation, you can take that the joint distribution for the neighborhood of phi can be written as the product for L in the neighborhood of I of P I L X L. Yeah. And finally, Assuming this, you close the equations, doing the same idea where in a graph or in a, in, a, in a matrix where you have removed something, and you can find that the single side marginal pi xi, where j has been removed, is equal to 1 divided some factorization, some, uh, sorry, a uh, normalization factor of exponential of minus z xi squared. And then I have the product for L belonging to the neighborhood of phi without J of the integral X L of exponential of X I A I L X L, the variety distribution at a node A L of X L when I has been removed. And uh, it's exactly the same uh, bloody equations and the cavity method for, for the easy mode, but continuous variables. Because if you look at the derivation mathematically, there is, no, there is nothing that prohibits you to do the, exactly the same steps. The only thing that, that you do is to change discrete sums by integrals, by, but integrals are sums, right? The same thing. Now, here, the, here is when uh, the different comes and that, uh, that People thought that it was a major obstacle. Why? Because you see the cavity method applied for easy variables. These marginals uh, can be parameterized by, by, by just one real number, right? Because the random variable takes values in the IC model plus minus one. So in this case, this is annoying, right? Because this is a real, uh, real variable. So you have a proper here uh, distribution, okay? Or a, or, a, or a proper function. So if you look at this, you might think, okay, 
this is, this is going to be very difficult to solve numerically. Right? How can I do this? Maybe if I were to parameterize these distributions or these functions, I need an infinite number of parameters, and then I need to close, to, to find a set of closed equations for those parameters. In the same way that in the exercise I left that, that we are going to do it for the cavity method in the, for this model, you have this closed set of equations for the cavity fields. But here it was just one parameter. Here, uh, in principle, I need an infinite number of parameters, right? Do you understand? But here, if you look at this expression, you realize something that there is a, a special set of functions that are a fixed point of, this, uh, of the cavity equations. So that means that if you take a particular form of this set of functions, the, the, the form of these functions does, does not change. It remains. Okay? So if you notice this, that means that you can use this set of functions, and this set of equations simplify a lot. So the question is, this would be the equation of the cavity equations. Again, the question is to realize that there is a particular, uh, there is a particular uh, family of functions for these guys, for the P, I, J, X, I. Can I say this thing? That functionally or, or, or whose form doesn't change under this iteration. Because suppose that, for instance, I put here a particular function, whatever. I don't know. Um, whatever you can think of, doesn't matter, okay? So after doing this integration, the form of this function might change, right? But again, there is a particular type of functions that, you know, after this process, the form of the function does not change. It remains the same. No, no more parameters are introduced or cre cre create, uh, cre um, generated, okay? So there is a particular family of functions for which the cavity equations are a fixed point. So the question for you is to find the set of functions. You might think that some or sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why functionally speaking, the form of the function does not change. Okay, this, the, those functions will depend will depend on a set of parameters. The parameters have to will obey a set of closed equations, okay, but the form of the function does not change. So no more parameters are, are generated. Yeah, because if, more, if you were to generate more parameters, that would change the type of function. It's the same thing. So suppose now that this is the equivalent, or you can understand it as a connectivity matrix or an adjacency matrix. The only difference now is that, is that, it, is that the, if the entry is different from zero, you may think that no, the nodes i, j are connected, and the link has a given weight, which is the value of that matrix en entry. Right? But uh, from a graphical point of view, of course, what I can have is given a matrix. A, I can put the of size n times n, I can put n nodes. Yeah. And then if this is not I and this is not J, the link between the nodes I and J is the N matrix entry IJ. Right? So unless the matrix Yeah, but you know, up to here, remember that up to here, you don't need to have any type of, you, know, you don't have to assume any type of sparseness with respect to the matrix. This is exact. When you are going to do, when you do the beta bias approximation, 
you know that the better price approximation would be exact for a particular type of trees, or in this case, for a particular type of matrices. Okay, but to get here is for any matrix. To get here is uh, for a particular subset of matrices, which are uh, those that uh, have this kind of tree structure. Yeah, once you are here, this has to do with the structure of this of this of the cavity equations. For? No. This part here, yeah. But for another part of matrices, it, work, it works very, very well. Questions? Go ahead. You don't get the notation with this one here? It's the same notation as in the cavity method. L belongs. L belongs to the set of neighbors, which are the neighbors of, the neighbors of phi, removing the node J. Yeah, remember that in the Cavity method, we introduced this notation that we have a node I. Well, this would be node I. This node is connected to a set of nodes. And this set of nodes, we call him DJ. And then in the Cavity method, let's say you remove one node. Let's say this one, J. Yeah? So the corresponding set of neighbors is the neighborhood of I without J. This uh, inverted line is a uh, minus notation in, uh, in, set, in set theory. No, we don't have a freedom, and that was a major obstacle to solve this problem, okay? So the cavity equations are what they are. And in principle, and in principle, this is, uh, these are just continuous, you know, fun, uh, you, this can be any function, yeah? But these functions, they have to weigh this set of closed equations. And it turns out that for a particular set of functions, yeah, uh, when you put them under this operation, the form of the function doesn't change. So that means automatically that that set of functions have to be the solution for this set of equations. Okay, so, but maybe there are smaller solutions, but we know one type of solution. Yeah, but you can prove that there are no other solutions. Ah, okay. Because if there were other solutions, they would generate, you will go, you will generate different functions. So this, this set of equations doesn't close. Questions? No, so then f first exercise, let us do it again like uh, we did yesterday, this one. But this is essentially the cavity method. Second one, this one. Third one, find a way to realize that there is a particular set of very simple functions that solve this uh, set of equations. Good? So I'll give you like uh, 15 minutes, five minutes, right? Uh, five minutes. Is that okay? Okay, so again, we do it in groups. So you turn around, you look at each other, and you form the group, and then you, you discuss. And I go around. Clear what you have to know? Yes, but uh, so the idea is that we Because this method relies only on this very trivial property of the exponential function. That's it. Yeah? So then the second thing, how we did this derivation for the easy model. The, the way we did it, remember, is that the, I want to derive the single side marginal at a given node. So what I do, what we were doing in that case, I'm going to do again, I'm going to use the notation for the easy model. What I did is to rewrite the Hamiltonian in such a way that I put explicitly the dependence on the node I, the interaction between I and the neighbors, and then the rest of the system. 
Now in this case, and that in that case it gave us the following. This was what? Minus H I sigma I minus the minus sigma I, the sum over all the neighbors of I of J I L sigma L plus the Hamiltonian where I have removed a spin I. Yeah, the, the reason I can write this thing in this way is due to the structure of the Hamiltonian, which is a two-body interaction, right? Now, in our case, the Hamiltonian that we have, which again, is not, is not really a Hamiltonian, right? I call it Hamiltonian because I'm, I'm abusing of this vocabulary from StackMac, is the following. So, H of X, it is minus set divided by two, the sum for I, from one to n of x i square, and then you have plus one half the sum for i and j from one to n of x i a i j x j. Right? So take this Hamiltonian and apply the same idea. Right? So from this Hamiltonian, I want to derive the single side marginal p i x i. So I need to isolate from here where is the node, yeah, the variable xi, how the xi is connected to the rest of the, the neighbors, and then the rest of the graph. And then you remember that the definition of this marginal is that this is equal to the integral over the whole system, but removing the node i of the original Gibbs distribution. That's it. Good? Better? So I give you 10 more minutes. Yeah? Uh, and again, li listen, I I'm doing everything by heart, so maybe there is a sign which is dancing around, okay? So don't believe what I write down, okay? <laughs> Just do the derivation. Come on. Yeah, what, what I'm trying to say is like, if you look at the derivation of the cavity method in or, 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 this derivation, okay, this derivation depends on the fact that the, the only thing that depends on is that you are using the property that the exponential of a sum of objects is the product of exponential of those, ob those objects, that's it. So if you have the exponential of A1 plus A2 plus A3, you know, this is equal to the product of A1, A2, A3, yeah? That's the most important property in this derivation. Any other thing is not important. It's not important that you don't have a probability distribution. It's not important the character of the variables. They can be discrete, they can be continuous. This is not important. The only thing that is important is you have the exponential of the sum of objects. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. So, so what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to communicate is when, the, when you do, for, not for in this case, for any derivation, focus on the properties which are the most important ones to do the derivation. Not thinking about the context in the in the context you are working, right? For instance, because sometimes you might think, ah, since I'm doing this derivation in the context of stat uh, statistical mechanics, this method only applies to statistical mechanics. Not true. False. Yeah. Tell me. Yeah. Then by default, L is going to be the neighbor because it's a connectivity matrix. No. Uh, it depends. I mean, if if you if this were really the connectivity matrix, then yes. If it's any any matrix, then you have to specify that you are summing over those elements of the matrix that connect not I with with its neighbor neighborhood. Yeah. Set minus. AII multiplying the factor XI square. Yeah? That's the only thing that changes. But again, what I wanted you to, to, to notice is that in this derivation, the only thing you, you, you use is uh, this very simple pro property of the exponential. Right? Very good. Now, this is very simple once you have here. And the question is have you thought 
of functions that when you plug them in the cavity equations, the form of the function doesn't change? Huh? Gaussian. Why Gaussian? Because yeah, because Gaussians are, uh, are stable under convolution, right? So therefore, if this is a Gaussian, okay, this is a convolution of Gaussian, this is a kind of Gaussian weight shifted. When you, if this were a, a Gaussian, after this, uh, this integration, you get a Gaussian, right? Because uh, this is an a integral o, a operation of, of convolution. That means if... If I realize that the subset of Gaussian functions is a fixed point in, in the set of the structure of this set of equations, and I take now the following parameterization, I take that pi xi without j is equal to 1 over the square root of pi delta i without j of the exponential of minus uh, xi squared divided by 2 delta Ij. And again, these are not really Gaussians, okay? This, I, I call them Gaussians, but this delta in principle is a complex number. So, right? Sorry, what, what are you doing? What am I doing? Yeah, what, what, have written, what, what I've written is the following. So as the, as the, as the colleague pointed out correctly, if this, uh, so this is a subset of functions whose form doesn't change under, under this integral operation. Those set of functions are Gaussians. That means if I put here a Gaussian, what I get is a Gaussian. So that means that the Gaussian are, are, are fully are characterized by two parameters, which is the, the first two cumulants, right? So now I do the same thing I did for the cavity method, but for the easy model. I parameterize this function, uh, and I write down the cavity equations in terms of those parameters. Yeah? So if I take this parameterization, I'm not putting the mean value because you, you, you have to prove that the mean value, uh, you have to take it equal to zero. So you only need the variance of the Gaussian. If you put this expression here, and you write down the corresponding equations for this delta, you will, you will obtain the following. That delta i without j is equal to my one divided by z minus a i i minus the sum for l belonging to the normal photo phi without j of a i l square uh, delta uh, l without i. These are the corresponding cavity equations when you assume that the form of this function are Gaussian. And the equivalent to uh, this, but for the marginals, would be the following. A, a delta i is equal to 1 divided by z minus a i i, the minus the sum of L in the neighborhood of i of a i L square delta L i. Then you have to remember you have to remember the following. In our mapping, the spectral density was related to the expectation value of xi square. So remember that we found out that the spectral density rho lambda of a was equal to what? It's equal to one divided by pi n, the imaginary part of the sum of i from one to n of x i square, right? But if this, uh, this is the form of the single side marginals, then the expectation value of x i square is precisely delta i, right? That I'm going to put here that depends on set explicitly. Therefore, rho of a sub a of lambda is equal to one divided by pi n the imaginary part of the sum of i from 1 to n of delta sub i lambda minus i eta. Yeah. And 
that's it. That solves the problem, and this could be used for very, very, very large matrices. And it's exact when the, ma the matrices look, uh, look graphically like, like trees. So how, uh, how it will work this algorithm? You introduce a set of parameters, these deltas, that are complex. You iterate this. This would be the, the equivalent of the, the iteration of the cavity equations, which is the belief propagation algorithm. When you have the solutions for these deltas, you put them here. You obtain delta i. You do this thing for all i's, and you get the spectral density for a given value of lambda. It's the same idea that, that you use to obtain the magnetization for the AC model on, a, on, on random graphs. Questions? Erdos or any graphs, right? They look, uh, they look locally like a tree, and the limit of this graph becoming large, the beta approximation is exact. Now you can do the following. I'm going to give, I'm going to give you another exercise. You, you do these derivations as an exercise. Now we are going to consider particular types of matrices which are related with what they are called as random regular graphs. Suppose we have a random random regular graphs. These are graphs, these are trees with a fixed connectivity on each node, but they are called random regular graphs because if you would have a tree, it will start growing and the boundary would grow, would grow exponentially. But at some point, the boundary close to itself, so then you don't have a boundary. So, so assume that you have a random regular graph where the connectivity of each node is k. Suppose that the connectivity for the number of neighbors of each node uh, is k. For instance, this means the following. Now, suppose that k is 3, the graph would look like this. No? This is a node. It has three neighbors. And the neighbors, they have three neighbors. And the neighbors, they have three neighbors, etc., etc. right? And at some point, it has to close to itself. So suppose that you have a random regular graph with fixed connectivity, and the weights of the nodes are the same. Like, for instance, one. So you have an homogeneous random regular graph. You have an homogeneous and homogeneous. This means uh, same weights for all links. All right. So for this particular set of graphs, you can solve exactly this set of equations, and you can say that the spectral density is equal to a given formula. Yeah. Okay. This, uh, so see, yeah, yeah. So what I'm trying, I was trying to say that is this mapping, this depends on this expectation value of this guy, and according to our parameterization, this expectation value is precisely the variance. And the, the solution, like the solution of the cavity equations, we always uh, find them either actively like the same time. Or unless, precisely, unless that in some cases, okay, they, they simplify, and you can uh, solve them uh, exactly, explicitly. Me. So in this case of random regular graphs with, uh, which are homogeneous, you can solve this set of, okay, of equations explicitly. Tell me. Yeah, yeah. So at random regular graphs is, uh, are graphs which are regular. So that means that all the neighbors have the same, all nodes have the same number of neighbors. Like for instance, in this case, I'm not, put, I'm not drawing the whole graph, just a, a, a small part, right? So in this case, all the neighbors have the same, all the nodes, sorry, have the same number of neighbors, which is three. Yeah? Three, 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 right? So that means regular graph. Random regular graph means that if you, if this were exactly a tree, you see uh, the boundary, if you expand this thing, the, one, the, the boundary of the graph will, uh, will uh, grow exponentially. Okay, and this is sometimes not good. So what you do is to take the boundary and you close it to itself. And, and there are many ways to close the boundaries. 
this gives rise to a, the random ness of the random regular graph. And the homogeneous part is that the weights of the links is the same for all links. So that means uh, for this matrix, okay, all the elements of the matrix are the same. Sorry? Yeah, you create loops, but if the graph is large enough, those loops are not important. If the, if the graph is large enough, those loops uh, are not important for this, uh, for this equation. It still is exact for very large graphs. Questions? Well, not that one, the, the previous one. How it is a convolution? Because this is a Gaussian weight, right? I'm, I'm missing uh, the diagonal part that I should have put there. A, a product with a Gaussian weight, and I'm integrating over a subset of variables uh, fixing the eyes. So this is the product of two Gaussians and integrating over a subset of ga these ga Gaussian variables. Tell me. Again, the only way to solve the variance equation is self consistently. Uh, for general cases, yes. Numerically, self consistently, yes. So you start with, you know, you, you, you start with some uh, initial values for these variances, and then you iterate this set of equations. Questions? More questions? Okay, thank you.